All right, thanks very much for uh, inviting me out. And I thought I would uh, share um, a little bit of a story about a very surreal project that's actually coming out of my lab right now. Um, because I'm an academic, I feel inclined to test everyone with a question. So I'm actually going to put a slide up. And I, I want to see if you can help me tell me what it is. Okay. So um, this is a slide. And I know it's a bird. I know it's a bird. So that's not the answer that I'm looking for. And so what I'm curious about is how many folks in the audience actually know what this bird is. Hands up if you know what this bird is. A couple, three or four. Are any of those people that have put their hands up brave enough to actually shout out what they think the bird is? Starling. starling, yes. It is a starling. It is a European starling. Okay. Um, now, the reason why I put this up here, okay, is because this bird is freaking everywhere. Like, it is everywhere. It is easily amongst the top 10 most populous birds in almost all temperate climates. It is so populous that I can almost guarantee that you have seen this bird. Uh, not only that, this bird is, uh, it's not shy. <laughs> so I can almost guarantee that you have interacted with this bird, okay? So if you go to Granville Island, or you go to Playland, or you're sitting at some park, and you're eating your cookie, and there's some avian that's kind of like descending upon you, trying to steal your food, Yes, it might be a pigeon, yes, it might be a seagull, but it could also be a starling. They're everywhere, and you have seen them, okay? And so what's interesting to me as an academic in public understanding of science, which is also PUS, for this, <laughs> not in the note. We have the worst acronym in all of academic PUS. So um, it, what's up with that? This is something that you've interacted with, and, and Hardly anybody in this room actually knew what it was. And I can compare that with like this picture, right? And so how many, pe and I know you're all grown up or mostly grown up in this room, but how many people in this room know what this is? Right, so not only that, how many people in this room know like what its special powers are, like what, what it can do. Hands up if you kind of know what it does. Okay, now we're gonna go deeper. <laughs> How many people here know things like what it evolves into and what hit points it has and stuff like that? Hands up if you know that kind of minutia. I'll note that minutia is roughly equivalent to the number of people that could ID the initial bird in that first slide, okay? And here's my point. It's, it's very simple. Not real. <laughs> real. Okay. Again, not real. Real. Okay. Now, so the the underlying, I guess, point I'm trying to make is that if if you are the sort of person that believes that people only care about the things they know. Right? You only care about the things they know. How does that put everyone's sort of ecological literacy or environmental stewardship in mind? When, you, when most of us didn't know what this is, I know you've seen it, and yet everybody knew what this is. Okay? And you'd be surprised. There's actually been some research to figure out how much people know about Pokemon. Okay? So I, I have a colleague in the UK and he actually did this study where he walked around schools and he tested cognition of Pokemon characters. Okay? And it was actually published in Science. And I, I won't go into the details, but the details is that kids know a lot about Pokemon. They know a lot about Pokemon. And in essence, my lab, a couple years later after this was published, uh, I actually approached Andrew and asked, you know, because in his science paper, he asked, the rest of the conservation community. So what is it about Pokemon that maybe we can learn from to get more children and more general public involved in biodiversity issues? Okay. And essentially he said nothing much happened. And so what I proposed was a crowdsourcing initiative. 
right? Because crowdsourcing is kind of great when your seed nugget of info is something as twee-ish as kids know more about Pokemon than they do about real things, okay? Now, crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, is not the same as crowdsurfing, okay? So, so this I actually know intimately. I've actually crowdsurfed once. Uh, I'm, I'm actually quite old. I'm probably older than almost everyone in this group. Uh, but I was at an Owl Lady Peace concert. I don't know if that works about. There was a throng of people, right? I climbed up on the stage. And I took this massive leap. Like, I wish there were pictures. You know the iPhones can take things in slow-mo now? I would be like a slow-mo arc into the midair, right? Not crowdsourcing, right? But that being said, there are some similarities between crowdsurfing and crowdsourcing. The idea here is that you're trying to get communities to kind of help out, to kind of contribute whatever it is that you're trying to do. What I wanted to do was make a card game, right? Kind of like Pokemon, but based on real things. When you talk about crowd uh, surfing and crowdsourcing, you have human capital, right? So i.e., the more eyeballs you can get to actually look at something, the greater the opportunity that something will actually happen, right? But in order to get that to actually happen, you need folks of influence as well. So for instance, in this picture, maybe the person jumping off has influence or the people holding them up have influence. I can tell you I have no influence because I forgot to mention that when I actually leapt like really high in midair at that Our Lady Peace conference, uh, the, the crowd of people actually parted with me. <laughs> and I kind of landed on the floor. So I had no influence. But that being said, if you're doing a crowdsourcing initiative, if you can gain followers that have influence, that's actually really handy. Now in this particular scenario, we were quite lucky. We had lots of folks with influence that kind of partaked, right? Um, I have some friends that uh, run the site Boing Boing, so that was a big help. They were able to sort of direct eyeballs, and we were able to get a, a piece or two written in Wired magazine. So the point is, is that we were able to get millions of people to check out this very vague statement coming up from my lab with letterhead, I might add, to make it kind of fancy or what have you, that we wanted to make a card game because kids know more about Pokemon, right? And in essence, so we started this in 2010, and what actually happened right away was that there were multiple communities that kind of aggregated around this. There's some very, uh, I guess, uh, obvious ones, like folks who were into nature, uh, folks that were into games, uh, folks that were into art, and folks that were into education. And it was really quite surreal, in a way, to watch the community dynamics kind of fold around this project. The art community was awesome. Uh, like within a couple months, uh, they had established a submission process. They had established a, a process where art was essentially donated at this point in time. And you can just sort of see a, 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 a kind of a, a palette of the sort of thing that was coming in. We also had a very feisty gaming community. Okay? My lab was primarily playing Diplomat. This was a very small, kind of angry <laughs> at the time and feisty and sometimes a little uh, rude type community. But they were kind of feisty about it because they were looking for perfection. They were trying to figure out a way to play a game that actually worked, right? So when you do game design, uh, it's actually very important that there's no issues or no, nothing broken in the, the actual game mechanics. So it was really heartening to see all of these communities come together in essence in a in very, and I have, to, I have to say, this is spontaneous. Right? It started off as sort of the seed nugget with a little bit of letterhead, and folks were just sort of aggregating spontaneously around certain expertise and certain facets. What was also cool was that there were a number of communities that were not obvious that were also forming. Right? So for instance, uh, one very important community was this very small band of intellectual property lawyers. Right? <laughs> Uh, which was kind of unexpected, uh, but was very useful because we wanted the project to be as open as possible, right? Uh, these were the folks that advised us not to call the project Philomon. Uh, that was the initial name of the project because the mom actually represented indirect trademark infringement, right? 
They would actually say that Hasbro that would own Pokemon probably doesn't have a problem with the project, but they may go after the mom because it would set a precedent for other things to come up. They, they actually, the, the example they gave me was Pornamon. <laughs> so so they just wanted that sort of thing not to occur. So they, they advised that we keep it to uh, file. Uh, we also had a, a small group of programmers that actually ended up making a website. So I encourage you to check out the website. Uh, all the cards are actually available on the website where you can select them shopping basket style and print and build decks and things of that nature. Uh, I, I can't imagine how much this website would be worth uh, if you actually sort of priced it out. But it's just kind of showing you the, the amount of goodwill around this type of seed magnet, right? What is, what is it with kids knowing more about Pokemon? The other thing that kind of came to pass, and this sort of involved museums primarily, but as the project was growing, the, the community was generally asking the following questions. I want to buy decks. How do I buy a deck? Right now it's an open system, so you print decks, and so ultimately the deck that you have is only as good as your printer, right? At the same time, we were very cognizant of the fact that each card coming through the pipeline was mainly on the back of an artist, right? If you look at the card, like the, the actual amount of hours that went into the production of the card is primarily the art that was going in. So at that point, the community kind of knocked heads and they tried to figure out a way. And what they did was that they suggested the idea that champions would be able to host their own decks. And by doing so, they would have the opportunity to commission, i.e. pay and compensate artists properly, commission art, but actually set up, and this is where the lawyers were very handy, sort of contractual terms where the host could potentially recoup the funding that they used to pay the artists. Does that make sense? Right? So, so i.e., there was sort of a mechanism in place where you could get real debts, right? And so what's been crazy over, so this actually happened in 2014, What's been crazy over the last three years, and I love this project, is that decks have been spontaneously appeared, right? And, and don't forget, these decks all feed into the same rule set. So you're literally collecting cards where you can build decks around it. And just to give you a really quick uh, idea of the types of things that are out there, um, we have a Darwin deck that came out last year, so this one tracks the Voyage of the Beagle, okay? Uh, we have a dinosaur deck, uh, a terra, sorry, that's totally incorrect. The museum would kill me. A pterosaur deck, not a dinosaur, by the way, a pterosaur deck from the American Museum of Natural History. Now, their modus operandi was the idea that they have all this media anyway for an exhibit, so why not just sort of reshuffle it into a playable card game, right? Uh, we have a genetics deck. That's actually a deck I brought out if anybody wants to play a little bit. Uh, we just completed a women in science and engineering deck. So the, the uh, old white guy says something stupid. This is actually in reference to Tim Hunt. I, I can talk to you a little bit later about that. But that's a deck that's in reference to that. There's also a deck, this is a deck by O'Reilly. And O'Reilly is a famous publisher that makes computer programming books. And they have these iconic covers. And they just wanted to make a deck for swag around their book covers. And, and what we're actually seeing is that there's just sort of these spontaneous, de spontaneous decks appearing. So I just received in the mail the first Danish deck. So I have no idea what it says, but it's a Danish deck around Ice Age organisms because a museum hosted it. The last thing I want to point out, and this is actually my favorite part of the project, okay, is that yes, you can have these fancy decks being produced uh, by champions, be they museums being, Maybe they're artists that want to sort of reposition uh, their media in terms of a playable card game. Uh, but what we're also seeing is that teachers are using the same system to actually get children to make their own classroom decks. So do you remember when you were like little and you would make the poster or the diorama type project, right? This, this is essentially the same thing, except every child would get to make a card. And if the teacher is sort of uh, creative about it, she will actually organize it so that that classroom of 24 or 30, in totality, 
those cards that actually make a playable deck. So here's an example actually from U Hill Elementary. Uh, this is a grade one class, right? So this is actually depicting organisms from Pacific Spirit. So I just wanted to spend this little time to show you that this project is kind of, it's really strange to me, but it's, it's, it's awesome in many ways because it's just sort of tangential in all the good ways, right? It's actually producing all of these offshoots whereby a game is being produced ultimately because they're trying to see if they can tie into this Pokemon phenomenon as well. And really, all, all I only want to leave off with is, you know, if you have an idea for a deck, right? Uh, my lab is routinely helping folks to sort of get these things off the ground. And essentially, I, I'd be happy to chat with anyone here if they have ideas in that manner. Okay? I'm going to stop there. But thanks very much for listening.